I was reminded by uh, Sunil and Arnab that uh, I should point here and explain why it's so terrible. Because you see this, what is written here, is a, an example of what is known the law of excluded middle. This is the foundation of thinking. You know, it's either something or not something. When our reasoning is deprived of that, it's really terrible. So this is why you have to find this example, sort of analyze it, and figure out what to do. But, but in general, it's sort of the law of excluded middle is something which should not be easily disposed of. Right? Things are either true or false, and it's good. Well, of course, there are all these wonderful examples, which I said, like the question, have you stopped beating your wife? is obviously tricky. <laughs> so, but let's not go there. There are people who spend years resolving this, the problem. So uh, here we get to basically a requirement for A. So what A has to be, it has to be a regular type. It has to have associative plus. And there is a term for such things. You know, if you have a type where you could do equational reasoning and you have associative plus, mathematicians call it an additive semi-group. And since they have been here first, we should keep the term. So what we discovered is the requirement on A is that it is an additive semi-group. You know, for example, integers. Normal integers give you additive semi-groups. Positive integers, excluding zero, also give you an additive semi-group. Real numbers give you additive semi-group. Polynomials give you additive semi-group. I'm just going through examples. There is an interesting problem which we discover. Mathematicians are very careful how they use overloading. And here we go. I mean, I'm sure all of you have an opinion about overloading. And opinions tend to come on two flavors. It's good or it's bad. And what I'm saying, well, guys, that's too simplistic an answer. We have to finesse it. That is, overloading could be very good. And, you know, we will see during this course that mathematicians used it in great effectiveness. Or it could be very, very bad when we do not use it with great effectiveness. So mathematicians, for example, always make plus commute. Any of you who took a course in, say, group theory and abstract algebra know, and it goes sort of without saying that if you write, if you have non-abelian group, you write multiplication with circle or with just like multiplication. If it's a billion, you write it with plus. Plus commutes. Everybody knows that. Sort of star doesn't always commute. We will eventually get to this issue. But mathematicians always assume that plus commute. Sadly enough, in computer science, people disregard hundreds of years of tradition. And some Glorious bodies come and say that we will use plus to denote string concatenation. <laughs> and you might not realize it, but it does not commute. <laughs> foo bar is foo bar. Bar foo is bar foo, and it's a totally different thing. So, again, there is a major problem. We discovered requirements on A. But if we are to sort of preserve these requirements, it's, it's either our piece of code not going to work for strings. By the way, does it make sense for strings? Multiply string by an integer. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Of course it does. You know, 
what is four, three times four? Four, four, four. Ah, oh, man. You know. Shouldn't be, should be self-evident. Right, so we have this problem. So we have a piece of code. So we either say that A is an additive semi-group, but then we throw away our ability to use it with strings, which is unfortunate. Or uh, we have to do something. Here, by the way, a real example, if you want to, to go look, where somebody uses this very algorithm for implementation of string-like class called ropes. It sits right there. It's used to quite, quite effectively. Now, uh, the rule which we need to, 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 to sort of do to enforce ourselves, we have to once and for all decide that we will stick to an established terminology. Right? And let me tell you, right in front of you, you see one of the worst offenders against such a thing. This is me. It's not Bill. <laughs> Why? And I, I'm not proud. I'm I'm very ashamed of a certain thing. Some of you might know that I'm the guy who did STL. Right? Some of you might even use some STL. And if you do, most likely you use a class called, which class would you use? Vector. Vector, guys. You use vector. And here, this is a very shameful fact. These vectors have nothing to do with vectors, which I knew and loved all my life. They don't populate vector space. Things in vector space do not grow, nor do they shrink. They remain in the same dimension. And they, they don't come from just any type. They come from a field. And you have operations such as scalar product and many other wonderful things. They're called vectors. Right? So let us think what happened. Was I delirious? No. no. Actually, I was not delirious. I thought I was doing the right thing. So when I introduced it in C++, my logic went like so. So I have to be humble and not invent a new term, said I. I have to use a well-established term. So I have to go and see what these things are called in common lisp and scheme. So what did I do? I picked a community with 50 people versus community with 5 million people. Right? I followed example of some very small transitory community. The scheme community is dead. At MIT, they're teaching Python. Right? But we're stuck with vectors forever. Again, mistakes which you make are very hard to undo. We have to be very careful when we use terms. We have to use them precisely. Right? Eventually, you know, I'll refer to, you, to a paper by Iverson called Notation is a Tool of Thought. But before notation, language is a tool of thought. We have to be very, very careful in our use of the language. And we have to use established terms. We should not use terms to mean what they are not. You know, have I done it? Yes. I, I just made public confession. If there were ashes, I would have put them on my head, but there were not ashes provided by the facilities. So, <laughs> you know, I cannot do that. I mean, it's, but we have to be very, very careful. Right? At least I call list, list, unlike Pythonic guys. <laughs> uh, so what could we do? This is an issue which bothered me for quite a while, sort of how to resolve the problem. And this is the rule which I claim allows us to survive. This is the rule which I called explicit weakening. We have to stick with mathematicians. And by default, additive semigroups are commutative. 
right? We should not break the default. If, however, we want to weaken a requirement for an algorithm, as we want to do here, we explicitly say non-commutative. We weaken the requirement. It's sort of is the punishment for whatever we did in the past. Takes about three generations. To, uh, right? So these are examples of additive semigroups. There are very many. Right? Observe they all of them are commutative. Important thing to remember is non-requirement is not a requirement. What do I mean by that? When I say that this algorithm requires non-commutative additive semigroup, it doesn't mean that it's not commutative. It could be commutative, but it's not required to be commutative. So this is this is again this is all just because we introduced this sort of bad thing. So now we are done with A. Non-commutative additive semigroup, A. It's long, but you know, that's that's because of the standard committee. <laughs> Otherwise it would be just additive semigroup. And we still do not know what N is. Now, what do we know about N? Remember, it's tricky. It has half and odd and equality with one. Um, we could do two things. We could actually do careful mathematical analysis and come with some structure which, which possess these operations. And those of you who have elements of programming could go and read about halfable monoids someplace. Uh, there is such structure. But what I claim that sometimes we don't want to do it. Sometimes, instead of saying, our requirements axiomatically, as we did with additive semigroup, we want to use a different way. We want literally say, what, what are examples of n? By the way, what kind of n? Anybody would venture to guess? What do we expect n to be? Yes, things like whole numbers, yeah, integers of different kinds. So this is just axioms we want to hold, but what we want, we really want it to be uint 8, int 8, uint 64, int 64, all kind of integers, all the way to big nums, by the way. Right? So all the models of integer-like types is what we want. So sometimes we, instead of defining things axiomatically, we could define them by enumerating intended models. And you say, well, that's mathematicians would never do it. False. Right? They do it. There are two ways. Well, mathematicians don't do either one, actually. They, they usually don't write axioms. They usually don't do models. But logicians do. And logicians have two mechanisms. Sort of one way is by doing proof theoretic way of defining things by listing axioms. Another one is known as model theoretic. When you list different intended models, it's a technical term, and say, I want this code to work on all kinds of integers. Right? And you say, eventually, I will figure out what axioms for integers are. And we will by the end of the course. Well, not we. I mean, Giuseppe Piano did, but whatever. We will, we will meet him. Uh, so uh, it's a perfectly legitimate way, so we will use this concept called integer. By the way, people ask me, how, so how do you write these things? How do you write template integer n? C++ has no concepts. Well, that's how I do it. You say, well, but it doesn't do concept checking. No, it doesn't do concept checking. But it compiles, which is a start. This is very, very poor man's sort of implementation of concept, but it works. So I just define integer as a type name. So and then I say template integer n, and it works. So And then I define a couple of things, like for halving and for odd. 
and uh, there is a bug uh, in uh, word or not, we could argue. Try to figure out whether it's a bug or a feature on the last line. Homework. Additional homework. Is there a bug here? I thought it's a bug, but maybe it's not a bug. I don't know, actually. But this is why I deferred to you. Uh, so now we could literally write a fully generic version of uh, our code. So it's A is non-commutative additive semigroup, and N is an integer, and the rest of the code is pretty much the same. Uh, observe that for multiply accumulate, N could be zero. That is, we do not need anything special if it's zero because we just don't add anything to accumulation. It changes when we do multiply on a semi-group. Why don't we have it defined for n equals zero for a semi-group? Because you see, let's figure out what it means to multiply by zero. If you say, oh, this is trivial. Well, it's trivial because they taught you what it means. But originally, people didn't know when even the notion of zero appears. It takes a while for people to figure out what it means to multiply by zero. Because you see, zero is an additive identity. It's not clear how it will work with multiplication. And the, re the way we figure out is by, remember, early on we said that we use distributive law as something which must hold. So we know that we want the, oh, pardon me. We want this to hold. We want A to be equal 1 times A. That's, remember, we agreed on that when we defined multiplication by an integer, right? Then it should be equal to 1 plus 0 A, because 1 and 1 plus 0 is the same. Then it should, because of distributivity, be equal to 1 A plus 0 A, which is equal to A plus 0 A, which means that 0 A is an additive identity, right? We should, and the problem is that semi-group doesn't have to have additive identity. It just doesn't. There is no requirement like that. Okay. Uh, what do we do? Well, mathematicians have another term. You know, they, for whatever reason, decided it's, it's very funny. There is no consistency in mathematical terminology whatsoever. Now we have to obey, but when they started, they didn't do it consistently. First of all, obviously, they didn't start logically with semi-group. Obviously, they came up with the notion of group. Then after about 100 years, they say, well, we could divide it by two. And they got semi-group. We will get group soon. So they started with a group, then they got semi-group, then they got monoid. These terms are not very consistent. But monoid is a semi-group that contains an identity element. That's what mathematicians call it. An additive monoid is an additive semi-group where identity element is denoted as zero. Right? For example, if we look at matrices, say, with coefficients being positive, positive integers, uh, pardon me, non-negative integers. It gives us an additive monoid, and it has zero matrix with all zeros. So, therefore, what we need to do, we need somehow to be able to write this, and we do. This, this is literally pretty much the way you would write it in mathematics, that to multiply in a monoid, you could now, we weaken the precondition, n could be zero, 
And if n is 0, we just cast 0 to our additive identity on A. Otherwise, we just use multiply semigroup. Right? Very simple. Group. What is a group? Group is a monoid with an inverse operation. What is inverse operation? Is an operation such that you have a cancellation law. Right? You could get minus, not everything, not every semi-group is a group. For example, obviously, positive integers or non-negative integers are not, mathematically, are not a group. Why did I say mathematically? Because you see in computers, they so happen, they are a group. Because they're not really uh, integers. They wrap around. They, there is a consolation. They are modular integers. So, uh, and here we come to a nice story. I promised you a story. So, everybody asks me, or at least my boss, my boss is the person in the back of the room who lives in the laptop. His name is Dan. So, he asked me, what is a group? And I had to tell him what is a group. And he said, why do they call it group? It's not clear. The simple answer, because once upon a time, there was a certain young troublemaker who decided to use word group. And here comes this remarkable story of a person who invented groups. Evariste Galois. And he is indeed the most romantic of mathematicians. Every mathematician talks about Galois. Why? Because you see mathematicians lead very boring lives. So they want to convince other people that not all mathematicians are boring. Well, they're not as boring as programmers, but almost <laughs> as boring. But so they all, they all talk about Galois because he's a clear counterexample of a life which was not boring, but it was very short. So let me tell you about Galois. You have to know about Galois. And obviously, he is very much venerated, at least in France. And venerated so much that they made a stamp where they called him both revolutionary and the geometer. So, well, he was a lousy revolutionary, let me tell you. But he was, he was a remarkable young fellow. Uh, he was born, as the stamp says, in 1811. And... Uh, Started his life in a fairly ordinary, he was the only son of a well-off family. Uh, they sent him to a great high school, maybe the greatest high school in the world, Lycée Louis Lagan. Any French people here who went there? You, know, you didn't go there? Mistake, you should have. <laughs> uh, it's a great high school. You say, how could you say it's greatest high school in the world? Well, okay, out of... It's graduates. You have Molière, Diderot, Robespierre, Pompidou, Lebeg, for those of you who know mathematics, Adamar, I could go on forever. Artist, Delacroix. So there is just remarkable school. So he goes to this remarkable school where he starts very well. I mean, the first year when he joins, and it's, the, it's, it's a six-year six year high school. Right? So uh, when he starts, and he starts at the uh, fourth, fourth year, I mean, they count from the other way. So the one is the last year. So he starts at the fourth year because they let him skip two grades because his mother taught him Latin. His mother is a prof proficient Latin scholar, very, very good. Uh, so he knows Latin. He skips two grades, does very well the first year when he's 12. And then he loses interest. He's one of those kids. He loses interest, never does well after he's 12. Sort of fails all classes. His teachers write, you know, this, I'm sure you heard this, oh, very capable but does not apply himself. <laughs> so he never applies himself to anything. Sort of drops to the fairly bottom of the class and always does something except what he is assigned to do. Like, he, he gets very much into mathematics, except not the mathematics they teach. 
they have wonderful mathematics, but he buys some mathematical books. Especially, he buys a great book on uh, equations by uh, uh, Lagrange and uh, studies it by, by himself, like becomes really proficient, but he doesn't study what he's supposed to do. And then, of course, when he, he needs to apply to, to enter college, he applies for the greatest school at that time in the world, called Polytechnique. The French will say it's still the greatest uh, school in the world. It is a very great school. So he applies for a called Polytechnique and fails miserably. Just not accepted, sort of the greatest mathematician, maybe of his time, fails the exam. By the way, attempts to pass the exam next year, guess what happens? Fails it miserably. So he gets disappointed. So he, he is accepted to a school which now would sound as a good school. He is accepted to a Col Normal Superior, and Benoit will say, oh, that's a good school. Not in 1830. It was a lousy teacher's college. It took them about 20 years to turn into a decent school. They were not even called Ecole Normale Supérieure. They called Ecole Normale, whatever. It was a lousy school. And he stays there for about one year. After that, he is expelled for bad behavior. So, I mean, clearly not a great success. He is also gets very involved in all kinds of revolutionary things. And you have to imagine again, let us move back to France in 1830. You see, these are dark years over Europe, the time of the Holy Alliance, where England and Russia and Prussia and Austria enforce the status quo, the ancient monarchist feudal regime. France, which was sort of invented the revolution. And just a few years back, they marched through Europe proclaiming liberty, equality, and fraternity. They, of course, thought that the way of spreading liberty, equality, and fraternity is by sending armies. For example, they go all the way to Moscow, burn it, in order to provide Russians with li liberty. <laughs> uh, it's an old idea, guys. Nothing, nothing is new under the sun. So, uh, so they go, establish fraternity, but then people say, we don't want fraternity, we want just to get rid of the French. They start <laughs> supporting their, their bad, tyrannical emperors, and they all unite and go and beat the French. And give them back their good old kings, Bourbons come back. So these are dark times. But every young man in France once, what? Liberty, equality, and fraternity. They all really sort of have this flaming idea. And right now, in France, they want what? They want cheese and sausage. You know. But at that time, they really believed it. Every few years in France, they had a revolution. For example, in 1830, they had a big revolution, a small revolution. Three days, three glorious days in July 1830, there are barricades in Paris. There's always barricades and, you know, women with naked breasts standing with a flag. It's a reference to a famous picture by Delacroix. So, uh, but, you know, they, they, they changed the world. And he's very excited. He wants to stand to the barricade. And he couldn't quite make it because he is a kid. Nobody takes him seriously. So... He needs to actually study, but instead of studying, he always gets in trouble. He gets expelled. Then he makes a speech about the king raising the toast, new king. In 1830, they get rid of the old bad king and get good new king. But he doesn't like good new king, Louis Philippe, so he, he says, drinks for the king and puts his dagger next to the glass. Well, people interpret it correctly. He's arrested, put in jail for a few days. Then a few months passes by. There's a big demonstration. So what does he do? He gets two pistols and a saber and goes in the front row. What happens? He's arrested and put in jail this time for 10 months. So he's always in trouble. He is not perceived seriously by anyone, even revolutionaries, because he's a crazy kid. 
he attempts to do mathematics, which he loves. He writes papers, sends them. They are ignored. There are some great mathematicians who look at them and apparently either lose his manuscripts or misplace, like Cauchy liked what he saw but said, well, you have to rewrite it and lost the manuscript. Uh, Poisson reads it and says, this is incomprehensible gibberish. So nobody listens to him. Lonely kid. And then terrible thing happens. He goes to some party, and there is somebody. What we know, it's again, it's all murky and dark. The some guy says something unkind words about some woman. This is this young romantic kid. What do you do when somebody says unkind words about a woman? You challenge him to a duel right there and then, and he does. So he challenged these guys to a duel. And again, I mean, his experience with fighting is going in front of the demonstration with two pistols and a saber. He is not trained. He doesn't know how to shoot. Uh, so, and then he realizes the next morning is the duel. And he has these great plans. And he writes what is arguably the greatest ever mathematical manuscript. He writes a letter to his friend Chevalier, Auguste Chevalier, where he explains his mathematical program. And then he goes and dies. Well, not right away. It takes him one day to die because the other guy shoots him in the stomach and, you know, in terrible pain. He dies after 24 hours. Uh, a terrible loss. It's, and again, the quote when I say a new star from uh, un unimaginable brightness. It's from another great 19th century mathematician, Felix Klein. Right? But everybody sort of from that point, sort of point actually is not 1832. He dies, nobody pays any attention, and he's uh, buried in a pauper's grave. Because he's just anonymous grave, there is nobody cares. Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave, grave too, so it's, it happens. Uh, Mozart wrote music. Uh, <laughs> but so a wonderful romantic story. But he disappears. Nobody knows about him for another maybe 15 years, less, 13 years, when Louis Ville, another French mathem mathematician, discovers this letter and some other manuscripts and presents it to the world is one of the greatest mathematical. This is probably the night of May 29th, 1832, might have been the greatest night in history of mathematics. I mean, there is sort of, in terms of density of what he did, there is nothing quite like that. Now I have to spend a few minutes explaining to you what did he do. Because so far you know that he marched with two pistols and a sword. Yeah. Uh, one of the outstanding problems in mathematics at that time was a problem of general solution of a polynomial in radicals. Remember, if you have quadratic equation, there is this formula you learned. Yeah, whatever the formula. And then in 16th century, Italian mathematicians, Tartaglia and Cardano, come with solution of cubic and quartic equations. So there is a formula for that. And then there is an outstanding problem. Could you do it for fifth, sixth, seventh? I could go on. Uh, and nobody knows. So Galois applies himself to this problem. Sadly enough, he is not the first to solve it. Another great mathematician who died very, very young, uh, Abel a Norwegian mathematician who literally starved to death, solved it a few years before Galois. But Galois doesn't just solve this problem. He doesn't just prove that you cannot have general solution and radicals in square roots for equations of degree greater than 4. He comes with an algorithm which allows you to establish for which equation of however large degree you could solve it or not solve it. And then, but that's also very minor. He comes basically with all the fundamental concepts of 
abstract algebra, right? He invents what we call groups. And not just invents groups the way I'm doing them. Now, trivial definition. He sort of d discovers the notions of normal subgroup. I cannot tell you. I mean, it's getting technical. And then he defines the notion of a field, finite field, what we now call in his own a Galois field. So he invents abstract algebra, not bad for a kid. Right? And you know, it's, it's something everybody ponders. What would have happened if the other guy missed? And we do not know. It's sort of, he clearly was a man of extraordinary genius, but maybe nothing would have happened. It's not clear whether he, he was able to lead a normal life and become a professor and publish many, many volumes of work. He, he, was, he was a strange guy. But in any case, uh, this is the only surviving portrait. Uh, we do not know then how close it was. Sort of a wonderful, I think, a wonderful story. And I thought that I should tell you about him. We will, we will learn more about abstract algebra for the rest of the course. Uh, okay. OK, so we could do now a multiply on a group by just using a simple rule that a times minus something is first multiply, then negate. Right? Uh, now, the next amazing step, and it's very difficult to tell you precisely when it was done. Uh, it was clearly known by some Indian mathematicians about 200 BC. They observed that the same algorithm uh, could be used for power. If we go look at our code, whenever was our final code for this, if we replace plus with star, we get an algorithm for a to the nth power, right? which is not particularly surprising after we did this abstract presentation. Since we figured out that it's fundamentally an algorithm on a semi-group, well, it's very easy to move it from additive semi-group to multiplicative semi-group. And people noticed this very long time ago. And that's what it's actually usually defined. It's defined on multiplicative uh, semi-groups. Uh, and what's the idea? We replace doubling with squaring. Well, we do A op A. If op is plus, it's doubling. If op is times, it's squaring. It's effectively, it's exactly the same algorithm. This is, again, we see that how wonderful things generalize if we try. Uh, so the only thing we change is that we change multiplicative, additive to multiplicative, and then we changed plus to star. The rest of the code is the same. It's literally the same. Now, power semi-group, well, I forgot. Now, it's not the only thing we changed. We also changed the order. Why did we change the order? Just because we want to follow the convention. Because you see, when people multiply by an integer coefficient, they say NA. When they raise A to nth power, they say A to the nth. And again, we have to follow conventions. We have slavishly do what mathematicians have been doing for, for, for a long time. So this is why I changed the order in power. So uh, the, rest, the rest is identical, except, again, I pass the arguments in different order. Because it's a to the n, not n to the n. So exactly the same, power monoid. 
what do we do with the group? Well, I need multiplicative inverse, which is 1 over A. Well, normal definition of A to the power minus 2 is 1 over A square, right? So that's what we do. It's literally just the mathematical definition. We're, we're not inventing anything particularly clever. However, so what we discovered is that we could generalize it for additive semigroups, multiplicative semigroups, but there are so very many different semigroups on the same type. Let us look at integers. Just normal computer integers, int. We clearly have additive semigroup with plus, yes? We have multiplicative. Any other semigroup? What about XOR? Does it give us a semigroup? What do you need to have to be a semigroup? Anybody remember? It's just one thing you need to have. Associativity. Is XOR associative? Yes, so it is a semigroup. What about end? Bitwise end. Yes, it is a semigroup. What about OR? What about min? What about max? You see, there are lots. Semigroups are everywhere. Right? All the good operations are associative. Division is clearly a bad operation. <laughs> Especially division with remainder. So, but uh, very slow. You know, there is a reason for that. Associative operations, they are fast. We will study division with the remainder soon. Uh, so what, what do we need to do? How do we handle this problem? We couldn't keep defining many, 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 many uh, algorithms. You know, X or semi-group X, you know. No, there is a general solution. The solution is, like mathematicians, now we could talk about that a given operation constitutes a semi-group. Not a type with fixed plus, but just an operation. Right? So what we do is we just, instead of saying that A is a semi-group, we say that there is a semi-group operation on A. And we pass it. Right? And it's, you know, how did we change it? Well, instead of where we used to write plus or star, we write op. Okay? Of course, it would be terribly nice to be able to write this little circle like mathematicians do. Ah, oh, we cannot do it. We have to, the, you know, the keyboards. No little circles. So we have to write op. It's not bad. It's not bad. So uh, we have a semi-group operation. We could pass to it. So this is basically, finally we get to a point where this is what we need. This is the final generic version. Except we need to do the following thing. We need to generalize it to monoid and to a group, which is a little bit tricky, but not too much. Again, so what do we need to do? This is our, this is just how we rewrite power. It's, it's the same. It's, it's literally the same. It's not, it's not worth spending time. Uh, so what, what we do, we say that we have to have a function on the operation which returns identity element. Because A cannot possibly know what identity element is. Identity element depends on the operation. You have to apply some function to the operation. Yes? Uh, should it be identity? No, because op knows about the set. What is operation? Opera well, mathematically speaking, what is a f operation? It's a binary function from A to A into A. It's there. You could pass it, but it doesn't, I mean, you're just passing redundant information. A is encoded in operation. It's the type of its arguments. 
after all, right? I mean, don't forget, we live in the world of strong typing, otherwise known as mathematics. <laughs> so that we know what our sets are. Right? So it's identical element of the operation. And it works actually like a charm. Let's see how we do it. For example, we know that if somebody gives us our dear non-commutative additive monoid, an identity element of plus, here we actually use the standard function object, is zero. So this, this is just, I'm saying mathematically trivial statement, that additive identity is called zero. This is what it says. And the other thing says what? That multiplicative identity is called one. But there could be other identities. For example, what is going to be identity for min? Maxent. Maxent. Right? The maximum element. So it's not necessarily zero and one. It could be who knows what. Well, usually something relatively good. It's either zero, one, or one of the hugest numbers or smallest numbers or something like that. Things, things are very, very regular. Right? Uh, and again, how do we do groups? We need to have an inverse operation of operation. Not an element now, but a function. And let us see just an example how we define it. It defines really nice. For example, you know, for, for additive things, it literally a standard definition. All of these are standard things. What I'm saying is that inverse operation of plus is called negate. And that's what it is. It's, it's a minus, unity minus is the inverse operation for binary unit. Uh, here, however, I have to admit a minor fault. Uh, apparently, my feet were hurting or whatever. I forgot the reciprocal. It's not in the standard. So while I could write that, I have to define reciprocal. You see, I, I don't say standard. Here I say standard negate. I cannot say standard reciprocal because I forgot. And it takes the standard committee about 30 years to rectify any of my oversights. Uh, it takes them about no time at all to introduce defects. <laughs> so this is reciprocal. Again, what's reciprocal? It's one of the type dividing by, I mean, not a very difficult thing to write. Now, so what did we learn? We learned this is basically, in some sense, my dominant idea. Every person has at most one good idea over the lifetime. This is my dominant idea. This is the only idea. I mean, you know, I published many papers, you know, did many things, but I had only one idea, really. Uh, and the idea is that you could take algorithms and define them on familiar mathematical structures. Let me tell you. I told you about Galois' story. Let me tell you a story about me. Uh, so the story is how did I literally discover it? Uh, it was very long time ago. It was uh, 1977, and I had an interview to prepare. Uh, you know, give a talk, interview talk, and I wanted the job desperately. Uh, it's very hard to give a good talk, especially when you want something desperately. Uh, and then, on the way home, thinking about the talk, so a wonderful, wonderful raw fish. And, you know, if you look at me, you realize that food and me were deeply in love. <laughs> so I see this raw fish. I buy raw fish. I go home. And my wife tells me that I'm going to be very sick and die uh, because it's not certified. It should have been frozen previously. But I say, e never mind. It was freshly caught. I saw it being alive, I have to eat it. I eat it, and my wife is always right. Uh, my temperature is 105. You know, they take me to the hospital. I'm 
you know, start raising up from my bed. You know what happens when you have this fever? You, you start floating. So I float, but I don't think about the fish. I think about the coming interview. And I need to talk about parallelizing computation because that's what they want to hear. And I never done anything about parallelizing computation. So it's very difficult. So I keep thinking and thinking. And then, while in this delirium, I see the following thing. I see 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And then I see addition regroup itself. It becomes 1 plus 2, parenthesis, plus 3 plus 4. And suddenly, I realize that something wonderful I see. Well, when you have 105, everything appears very wonderful. So, uh, and then I have the second insight. I plus changes, you know, you could really build it into a movie, you know, this vision of plus changing into the vision of star. I see star, I see that I could, instead of regrouping plus, I could regroup star. And then I see XOR circled with a plus, and it regroups just for four things. And then I see all these operations. And then finally, the word comes to my mind, semi-group. Because you see, I used to be trained as a mathematician, but then I became practical programmer and realized that I have to throw away all of the mathematics away. It will never apply. It's all nonsense. I'm sure you heard that. Uh, and Suddenly, while I'm thinking about this programming, about this regrouping, these semi-groups strike back. So I'm from that point on, from 1977, October 1977, till today, I basically do one thing. I'm trying to explain to people that semi-groups or rings or fields or other mathematical objects are wonderful and they appear in programming everywhere. So, that, that is another way of explaining what I'm going to be doing during this course. So, <laughs> yes, I did, and it was a terrible job. <laughs> if, I mean, this is, you never, uh, you know, it's very hard to predict. Sort of things which look so wonderful, not always wonderful, and things which don't look wonderful could turn, I mean, you know, life is funny that way. Uh, it was a huge disappointment, but one of the reasons, I don't want to go into that. Uh, if I didn't get the job, I still probably would have been in Russia. So if you want to thank somebody, it's the, thank those people who gave me the job. Uh, it's a complicated, long and complicated story, which involves many evil organizations and whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, whatever. There is here, the, we need to do just a little more, and we have a little more time. Uh, there is even more important thing we learned that power is defined on semi-group. But there is an even more important algorithm, which is in some sense the most important algorithm in the world, bar none. It's the summation. Right? There is nothing more important. I mean, you know, what do you do? You add things, whatever they are. Usually, well, think about what Dana does all day long. <laughs> Summation. I don't think she does products, but she does sums. This is what people do. It's the most important algorithm. And what its foundational structure? Semi-group, additive semi-group. So you, you remember, that's how mathematicians add things together. And multiplicative semi-group. And then we could generalize the way we generalize from power to an arbitrary semi-group. We could generalize summation or product to a notion of a reduction, which is a wonderful notion, which was, we will be talking very briefly about reduction right now which was introduced by a very great computer scientist, Ken Iverson, uh, in APL, who figured out that you could say plus slash. This could be in any binary operation, in his case, even minus. Right? Think about why it's 
problematic. Then it was extended even more so by John Beckers. And we're going to post two papers which I highly recommend that you read. Is a paper by Ken Iverson entitled uh, Notation as a Tool of Thought. This is his Turing Award lecture. And there is a classic paper by John Beckers. By the way, John Beckers is the guy who invented uh, programming languages. It's a minor thing. He was the first guy who decided that you have a programming language. And he was the lead designer of which language? Fortran. Fortran, the first programming language. He also invented functional programming, tiny little word. Uh, but uh, the, 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 his paper on functional programming is a classic. Again, you have to at least browse through. It's called Can Programming Be Liberated from the Von Neumann Style? Style, this is not architecture. Uh, well, the short answer from me, no. But uh, he, he was mistaken and thought, uh, he was a wonderful guy. His work strongly influenced mine. Uh, then there were some people uh, who, in 1981, realized that, that uh, reduction should be defined on associative operation and extended reduction to the notion of parallel reduction. And, of course, all of that is forgotten, and everybody knows that reduction was invented by Google. <laughs> that's, but that's, you know, they invented integers. You know. uh, so uh, we will put papers, we will put papers on, on the website. And now to the main homework. We will be working on this homework for the rest of the class, through all four journeys because it's very awfully important homework. But you should try to do it in a week. Uh, so try to design a library version of reduction. It's not much code, but there is a lot of things to contemplate. It's one of these things which will take you, potentially give you good, good feeling for what, what we need to do. All right? And I hope that you will still come next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>